Good morning. Welcome to Grove Church. We're so glad that you get to spend this time with us. We're going to jump into the book of Matthew. We're going to be studying it all month. So now is a great time to go and spend time with Grove Church as we connect with God and one another. Welcome to Grove Church. We are present for God. Hear this call to worship from Psalm 96, verses 2 and 3. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to declare the praises of the Lord. We're going to uh, lift up his name and glorify him. A part of that we recognize is that we realize that we need the Lord. We need God. So it's our weekly rhythm to come and seek God's forgiveness and restoration in our life and prepare us to encounter him. So I will lead us in this prayer of confession. And ask that you use this time to seek God's forgiveness and redirection in your life. Merciful God, in baptism you grafted us into the body of Christ, promising us forgiveness of sin and newness of life. But we fail to live as forgiven people. We keep destructive habits and hold grudges. We allow our past to hold us hostage and are reluctant to welcome newness. In your loving kindness, have mercy on us and free us from sin. Remind us of the promise you have made to us in baptism so that we may live as your people, claimed in the water of promise. Amen. God, in his whole posture, is toward us, is drawing us in, is forgiving us, and welcoming us as his children. Hear these encouraging words of forgiveness and pardon from Romans chapter 8. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Praise God that in the power of the spirit, we are joint heirs with Christ. We see the love of God at Christ's baptism. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As God has given us peace through Christ, let us share signs of Christ's peace and welcome to those in your household and those online. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. So in the comment section, share signs of Christ's peace and love. And if you're next to somebody, give them a hug. As we recognize that God has broken down the walls and called us beloved children. Speaking of children, uh, why don't you uh, call the little ones or those who have childlike hearts as we have a special message for them. Hey kids, it's Pastor Steve. I'm so glad we get to spend time learning about God's Word. Uh, we are in the book of Matthew, which is one of the Gospels of Jesus, uh, about Jesus. And we're going to be talking about Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew for a while. Today, in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus gets baptized. But before that, I want you to ask you, what is this? Yeah, nothing tricky, no magic. It's a, a bottle of water. And what is water good for? What do you do with water? Well, I know there's been a lot of hand washing, right? I remember there's commercials of making sure water is good for cleaning. You could wash your hands. You could wash, you know, in the shower. You wash your body, uh, wash the dishes. 
wash a floor. Your water is great for cleaning, for washing. What else is water good for? Yeah, drinking, right? It refreshes us. If you're thirsty, it's the healthiest thing you could drink. Better than soda and coffee and all that stuff, right? So water is good for us. It refreshes our body. Um, in Matthew 3, there's this man called John the Baptizer because he baptizes people. We're going, what is baptism? He actually baptizes Jesus. Well, this is a baptismal font. This is here in Grove Church. This is uh, one of the ways, the main way that we baptize people. We take water. We, it's not magic water. It's not special water. But we take water. We put it in here. And then we take the water and uh, we sprinkle it or pour it over someone who's being baptized. We pour it uh, over children of, of believers, children of Christians, babies. Last time it was little baby Justice took water out of here and poured it on him. and reminded, It was a reminder to him and to us that he is a child of God, that he's part of God's family, right? So, and then there's times when we baptize adults. Sometimes we use the water here and we pour water, sprinkle water on the head, or sometimes we've taken people and we've uh, dunked adults underwater and brought them out and we baptize them because they said, yes, uh, Jesus is my forever friend and we want to live for God and be God's forever friend. And they, it's a sign and a seal that they are part of God's family. They're a child of God. So it's the water. Water reminds us that water cleans, it cleanses. So when we baptize with water, we're reminded that people's, that Jesus cleans their soul, right? The water doesn't. Water cleans germs. Uh, but in baptism, we're reminded that God cleans people and cleans their hearts and helps them to be part of his family, children of God. So ask your parents, ask your family about the day you were baptized. Maybe you can't remember. Maybe they, they could have pictures or videos or maybe just a story about where and when and how you were baptized. Maybe you haven't been baptized yet. Maybe it's a great time to go and, and have this sign and seal of God's love for you, a reminder of God's grace. When Jesus was baptized, God the Father said from heaven and said, This is my son who I love so much, with whom I'm well pleased. Because God reminded and told people, let people know that Jesus was God's son. You are a daughter or a son of God. And baptism reminds us that. Can I pray for you? God, we thank you, Lord, that you clean better than water, that you refresh us more than a cold glass. We thank you, Lord, for these children. We pray that, Lord, they be reminded this year of how you love them, of how they're your beloved sons and daughters. Thank you, God, for helping us to be part of uh, our, our own families, part of this bigger family of God. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let us worship God.
Good morning. The scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. The people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me, 
comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from, Jude from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dorothy. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray, Lord, that you may speak to us. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to connect with you. So, God, we pray that you be present as we reflect on these words of life. Amen. Before we jump into this passage, uh, if you're a new reader in the Bible, a new Christian, you know, or getting to know the Gospels for the first time, you may be wondering what on earth is going on with John the Baptist, or as I learned to call him, uh, John the Baptizer, to avoid any confusion with our Baptist friends. Because uh, when you read this description, you may be thinking of some guy on Bergen Line that you're trying to avoid uh, while you go and take care of what you need to take care of. But uh, this scripture, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, was written to mostly a Jewish audience 2,000 years ago. So uh, those people would know their Hebrew scriptures, their Old Testament, really well. So the first readers of this book would have read the description, and they would say, hey, this, that description kind of reminds me of the prophet Elijah. And they would hear what was being said about John uh, the baptizer and his ministry, and they would say, okay, those, there's a quote there describing his ministry from the prophet Isaiah. And you see him in the style of Elijah and doing this ministry mentioned in Isaiah. And you would say, John the Baptist is a prophet. He has this prophetic type ministry and outlook. And those of the people who knew those scriptures so well would have seen uh, this prophetic role, a prophetic office of John the Baptizer a mile away. Speaking of a mile away, uh, John's ministry is in the wilderness. So he's drawing a crowd. People are coming out to him to hear, to see, to experience the message he's about. They left the civilization of their neighborhoods and stepped into the wilderness to see and hear what God was doing in the ministry of John the Baptizer. This journey in the wilderness has echoes throughout the Bible. There's things that happen specifically and specially in the wilderness. If you think of Moses, that he led people in the wilderness for 40 years before they were able to enter the promised land. The prophet Isaiah that is quoted here in Matthew 3 is talking about making a road, that there's a voice in the wilderness that is saying to make a road for the Lord. These, uh, these themes of uh, journeys and pilgrimages found throughout scripture, making a road and traveling and following You'll find that all over the Bible, and you'll find it in the Christian life as well. The spiritual discipline of pilgrimage is actually growing in popularity. Uh, for those of you who know, a lot of you do, that a couple years ago, my uh, leadership doctoral cohort, we were planning to go on a pilgrimage in Spain, and because it was uh, the time of 2020, the borders were closed and we ended up going on a different sort of pilgrimage in California where we walked 100, 120 miles uh, together. We, there was no sightseeing destination. It's not that we're going to, uh, you know, to Disneyland or going to something great at the end. The process, the whole point was the, the process, the walking. We saw fascinating things in those 100 miles. Uh, 
uh, but there was nothing impressive that we were going to. Um, and a hundred miles for some of you may seem, walking a hundred miles may seem uh, impressive in itself. But the interesting thing is that walking a hundred miles is just doing the same thing you did this morning as you walked to the refrigerator, or as you walked to the car, as you walked to the kitchen table. Uh, walking a hundred miles is made up of those same steps, that same process, just taking one after the other and being intentional of how you're doing it and where you're going and what direction you're leading into. The walk of faith that we're talking about this morning uh, may seem far from uh, what you've been doing. Maybe you see these people, John the Baptist, right? And Jesus. And you say, you know, how can we learn from these figures that are so big and so uh, renowned? But in many ways, they are walking in the same ways that we're called to walk. The same journey, the same pathway. It may look a little different uh, in your time period and with your gifts and challenges. But it's the same thing. It's taking small steps in the same direction of God's faithfulness. Jesus calls us to be like him. Jesus uh, makes us and conforms us into his image. And they may sound to you like, uh, you know, Jesus calls us to walk a hundred miles or more like it, a thousand miles. It seems impossible. But God calls us to walk and follow him. And walking and following is just taking steps. Step after step, one step at a time, following God in, obe uh, in obedience. With technology, I think the word follow has gotten watered down and changed, right? Water, uh, following kind of means uh, watching from afar. Like, I follow that person on Instagram, which means you uh, watch occasional videos or pictures that they share of whatever they're doing and whatever they're talking about. Um doesn't mean you know them, doesn't mean you've ever talked to them, it doesn't mean you've even commented or engaged on them. Like some of you follow us on YouTube, you know, and haven't, you click follow, but, and we're glad you're following and you haven't, you know, follow now, but uh, you are, maybe don't, maybe we don't even know you, or maybe you haven't commented, or maybe you have been keeping that distance. Follow nowadays has some distance to it. Like I'm following that news story. It means that you're just keeping tabs on what's happening in that area. But when Jesus calls his disciples, when Jesus calls us to follow, there's a proximity, it's not a watching from afar, there's a relationship, there's an involvement, there's a commitment. The following of scripture, the following of this Christian walk is connected, it's not sightseeing from afar. His disciples, the disciples of Jesus were in step with him. They were literally following him and seeing him and talking to him and hearing from him. And that following uh, is very different from this distant following that happens nowadays. But I'm getting a little bit of our head our, ourselves here. We're in Matthew chapter 3. Actually, Jesus' ministry hasn't begun. Uh, he has no followers, no disciples yet. And John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus' mission and ministry, right? This is part of what John the Baptist, his role and what he's doing, what we just talked about. John is baptizing people who are taking some important first steps in their walk with God. In verse 2, John is proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is near, that people need to repent, that they need to change their hearts, they need to change their lives and align them with this kingdom of heaven. And people are responding. People are getting baptized. They're saying a no to following their own ways and yes to following things God's ways. Life change is happening and the baptism is signifying the inward cleansing that is happening in the process. And this is a vital first step. Some of the people may have taken steps to first, right? They left their comfort zones of their homes and houses and neighborhoods to go out to the wilderness. They've taken that steps, and then the crowd, then people within that crowd respond. Maybe you have taken some steps. Maybe you're part of that crowd. You've left the comfort zone of watching whatever you were watching online or just scrolling or a comfort zone of doing something else in your household. Maybe you're part of our church community in one way or another. But maybe you haven't taken that step forward. 
that step to uh, repent. Maybe you're taking steps, you're, you know, watching church online, uh, but there's a step, an important step, that is to be a follower of Jesus. Not a long distance follower that is watching God from afar, but repenting, having a heart change, having a life change, asking God to help you to live the life and to follow Jesus, to respond to the kingdom of heaven that is at your doorstep. The presence of God is at hand. And there is that invitation, that step that needs to be taken at some point to say, yes, I want to be transformed. Yes, I want God to be my king, the leader of my life. Yes, I want to live for Christ. I don't want to go things, do things my own way and get the consequences of my own way. I want to be a new creation. I want to be a believer. I want to be a Christian. I want to make that you turn in my life. I'm going to repent to change direction away from living life on my own terms and take that step toward and into the kingdom of heaven for the king of kings. Every step towards this kingdom counts. In verse 7 to 10, the baptizer sees the religious leaders within the crowd. And the year there, the religious leaders, there's these two groups that are mentioned here, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they were there in the wilderness. Maybe they went for curiosity. Maybe they went for critique. But John the baptizer, who's helping people to respond, to take their next step into genuine repentance, genuine life change, he spots these critics. He spots them there. And he has some harsh words for them. John calls them vipers. He calls them snakes. But he also has an invitation for them to take a step forward. He says in verse 8, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, let your life be in line with this kingdom of God. Let your life show that God is moving and active and that you're part of this movement. If you're a religious leader, let your life show it. Let there be fruit of repentance. And he explains and gives common responses to their maybe excuses or maybe their outlook. Like he says, you know, don't say that you're just an ancestor of Abraham. Right? Don't look to your family history to find your identity. But instead, live life with the fruit of repentance. Let your life show that God is living and active. Don't just point at your family tree. And while this was happened 2,000 years ago, this is not just an ancient problem. This is a today problem. Us Christians have this problem that says, you know, don't tell me you're a Christian. Show me you're a Christian. Don't just tell me your qualifications of how you were baptized when you were a baby or you were raised in the church. Don't just write on your social media bio, God first, right? Now you could write that, but that's not that your your faith does not depend on that one line in the bio. Show me. Let everything else in your social media feeds show that God is first in your life that you're living a life that where God has first priority. And maybe you look back to that time you were 12 or 13 and ask Jesus into your heart, and that's great. But there should be some more evidence of what God is doing in your life than that prayer you prayed 30 years ago. Let God show God's self in your life. And so... For those of us who've been a, a Christian for a while, this may be a next step for us, right? The other one was maybe for new folks or folks who are t coming back, those steps of repentance. But for us, maybe we have a Bible. Maybe we go and are connected to Grove Church or another church. Maybe we've confessed Jesus, hopefully we've confessed Jesus as Lord with our mouths. And we've taken those steps, but there's other areas of our life that are out of sync. There's parts of our life that are not bearing good and godly fruit. We confess our faith with our words, but not our lives. Maybe you've seen that meme that's been floating around that said, if you were charged with being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Right? It's great to have the thoughts. It's great to have the Bible. It's great to talk the talk. It's, it's great to pray. All those things are good things. But there has to be more. There has to be more evidence. There has to be fruit that is in keeping with repentance. 
it's good to have the internal thoughts be connected. But what area of your life do you need to turn over to God? What area, what is the next step towards fully living into God's calling and claim on your life? Every step forward matters. No matter how small, every step counts. Little spoiler alert that these Pharisees and Sadducees, most of them don't take that step to show lives that are fully connected to God. They have the head knowledge, but throughout the scriptures we'll see that they don't make that step to live lives that connect. They continue to play this similar role in the ministry of Jesus as someone who challenges him, who has a lot of knowledge, but are not living those life. They have the credentials, but they don't show the transformation. And then we have John the baptizer. Remember, he looks like a prophet. He smells like a prophet. He talks like a prophet. And he's on this, but he is still on this journey of following God because we all are. We all have next steps to take, right? We, one day we'll arrive and we'll be fully into the kingdom of heaven, but now we're walking towards it and into it. And if we're still alive, we're still on this journey. And in verse 13 and 14, uh, John the baptizer has some hesitations because Jesus is asking John to baptize him. Of course he has hesitations. Who wouldn't, right? In John's eyes and maybe in our eyes, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem right. But his next step is obedience. Obedience, obeying Jesus. To lead you have to follow. To lead people to Jesus, you have to follow Jesus yourself. John, the baptizer, submits his will to Jesus and submits his plans and listens and even baptizes Christ. Even though he doesn't feel qualified. Even though he doesn't know if that's exactly the way he should be doing things. Even for those seasoned Christian leaders, we constantly have to be following God. We constantly have to be taking our plans and our priorities and submitting them to God's ways and make sure that we're not doing things our way, that we're living lives and we're even ministering God's way. Right? Grove Church, we can't just go on autopilot and just try to do all good ministry stuff. We have to make sure we're doing what God wants us to, to do. We can't just assume that God is on board with our church plans, with our family plans, with our personal plans, with our career plans. Moment by moment, decision by decision, we're submitting to the Lord our lives. And then we have Jesus in the scripture. Jesus, who's fully God and fully human, and he too takes steps, even though he's without sin. He takes steps to fulfill his mission and his purpose. Here in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus tells the baptizer that he is being baptized by him to fulfill all righteousness. Even though John has been baptizing sinners, John has been baptizing people who have done messed up things and know they need a life change and know they need to turn around and are ready to make that decision and are ready to trust God more. But Jesus, sinless as he was, is baptized, take the step into baptism for righteousness sake. To, to be uh, connected to all humanity. He has no need to repent himself, but he identifies with sinful humanity in his baptism. And he, this is kind of the initiation uh, of, of his uh, ministry. He identifies himself and connects and baptism fulfills righteousness. And he is living out his calling and mission. And this happened by him taking the steps into the waters of baptism. As he takes this pivotal step, the beginning of his ministry, we witness the Trinity present, right? God is Father, Son, and Spirit. So God, the Son, Jesus Christ, is in the waters. God, the Holy Spirit, descends like a dove. And then God, the Father, with a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit, uh, the Father, and the Son are there present, affirming, affirming this mission and ministry of Jesus, affirming what God is doing here in this place. The Christian life is not static. We are part of God's mission, 
And we have a purpose and a role to play. We are to glorify God with all our lives. And every moment, we have opportunities of obedience to the King of Kings. And to take a step toward the kingdom of heaven. Every step forward, no matter how small, counts. What steps do you need to take today? Do you need to take the step of repentance? To ask God to help you to change your life, to change your heart? Or are you taking a step of obedience? To, to bear a life that shows more of God's fruit. Maybe there's a specific area that is not bearing fruit, a specific area where it doesn't show what God's doing. Maybe it's a larger, big picture thing. But what is the next step for you to have fruit of your relationship with God? And maybe there's a step to submitting your plans to God. Because maybe there's ways you rather do things. There's certain preferences, the way you rather operate. Certain things that look right in your eyes. But you have to ask God to seek Jesus. To ask him to lead you, to guide you. To make his plans your plans. To step into that. Or maybe it's stepping into the mission and purpose that God has called you to. There's things for you to do. There's things for you to participate in. There's mission and ministry in God's world. And God is moving and active and is asking you to step into that, to take the next step. Every step towards the kingdom counts. No matter how small, every step toward counts. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are good and faithful. We pray, Lord, that you make clear our next steps, that you shine your light in our path, and that you give us the courage and the boldness to go forward in whatever way you command us to go. God, we ask for your help. We ask for your peace and for your presence. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for those that are sick, those that are struggling with mental health issues. God, we pray for those who are struggling with doubt and discouragement those who feel rejected and pushed aside. Oh, Lord, give them comfort. God, we pray for those who are lacking purpose and meaning. Pray that you remind them, Lord, that you created them in your image and that you have called them to follow you. Lord, we pray for our friends and family that are far from you, that don't know you or your word. Guide them, change and soften their hearts. Help them respond to the good news of the gospel. And we pray this all in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We want to thank you for participating and for all your giving in 2023, uh, 2022. Uh, if you're interested in giving envelopes, if that's helpful for you to worship with, just contact the church office and we'll give you these uh, envelopes with uh, giving or you could give, continue to give online. One of the things I want you to know that we did not meet our benevolence budget for last year, which means that there was difficult to help uh, the homeless, uh, the food pantries, uh, the chaplains, the EMS in our neighborhood. So if you want to give towards that and missionaries overseas, just make sure you mark your giving as benevolence. And that will help us help others and help our those in our community and around the world. But we want to thank you for partnering with us and giving to God through Grove. Also want to invite you that this Tuesday we begin our uh, Zoom Bible study. So if you're interested in that, let us know. We'd love to um, to have study God's word with you as we complete uh, the book of Acts. So join us on Zoom this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Thank you so much for spending time with us. We know you could be doing a lot of things in a lot of places. Um, but receive this blessing before we continue. There is another song and some reflections, questions coming up. But receive this. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Now and always. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. Your grace is more than sufficient for us. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me that again church your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me so remember your people remember your children remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. God, I see your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your 